people are slowly coming in. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Phil. Shannon, Agnes. Um, please let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, Eileen, Jillian, hello, everyone. Yeah, go ahead and, and um, add any uh, comments, uh, any anything you have in the chat. Um, we like when folks are active. And of course, um, once we get started, um, if you have any questions, um, please put those into the Q&A section on the bottom left. Um, you can add that at any time during the talk. All right. Um, and as people are coming in, I, you know, I'll just get started. Hi, if this is your first time here, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator here at the Mark Twain Housing Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Thanks so much for joining us for this virtual program for class, a memoir of motherhood, hunger, and higher education. Um, first, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We're very happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wishwell Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. Um, if you are not a member, please consider supporting our museum by becoming a member. All members receive free admission to our author programs, uh, free admission to the house and museum, um, receive year-round discounts in the store and cafe, and, and much more. Um, you can visit our website for more information on that. Um, now on to our guests. Our author, Stephanie Land, is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and A Mother's Will to Survive. Her work has been fe featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, and many other outlets. Her writing focuses on social and economic justice and parenting under the poverty line. Our moderator, Sabrina Ora Mark, is an award-winning fiction writer and poet who has written the column Happily for the Paris Review since 2018. Uh, Happily was published as a memoir and essays earlier this year. Um, Mark earned a BA from Bernard College, um, Columbia University, an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, and a PhD in English from the University of Georgia. Um, as I said earlier, during this event, we encourage you to have a conversation with each other in the chat. Um, if you have a specific question, though, please post that into the Q&A section. That's just so we won't get lost in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, um, that is all from me. Um, please sit back and enjoy, and I'll turn this over to Stephanie and Sabrina. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> oh, there I am. <laughs> I'm very excited to talk class um, this afternoon. It's just such an extraordinary book, and um, I wanted to actually start with this word relentless. I think it's like the first uh, um, early in the book, I think the uh, professor um, criticizes an essay that you had written as relentless. Um, and it turns out for me that, um, you know, and I'm thinking about being in, in, in writing workshops and, and the different kind of, you know, criticism we get. And sometimes it feels like the harshest criticism we get ends up becoming a kind of hidden praise like for me that word relentless is just this like beautiful word that seems to kind of like bloom throughout class um and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and um just just what that word even you know what what is inside of what what engine lives inside of that word um and also maybe some other you know good criticism, um, hidden praise that you've, you've received? I'll have to think about that last part. Um, well, first I want to say, um, hello, Mark Twain House. I'm um, so happy that this event could work. I, um, it was a highlight of the maid tour for sure. So um, bummed I can't be there in person, but I think at this point that would be physically impossible. Um, so the, I think, you know, the, um, I think the design of writing workshops is, is kind of toxic. 
uh, in and of itself. I think, you know, it's very rare that you actually hear good things about your work, or it was for me um, in my experience and what I saw other people experience. Um, it, you know, every once in a while, um, an essay would come across as as well written or or good or you know within the style that the instructor liked and appreciated and other students like nodded in approval um mm -hmm. that was usually someone who fit the stereotype of the type of person that the program was looking for um very white and male and outdoorsy and and who liked to fish a lot um so it it was um I, I, you know, looking back, I, I think there was a lot of that that was present um, that I just didn't really fully understand. Um, I thought I was, um, I, I thought I was a, a really horrible writer, to be honest. Um, I, I, I received nothing but criticism and how my writing was too simple and um, I wasn't literary enough and and didn't really understand a lot of concepts um, that other people uh, said they did. Um, like we were never really taught how to write a scene. Um, it was just this almost like a, a chant of like show, not tell. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, I, I learned how to write by freelancing and and by writing my first book really um and so i i don't know if there's a lot of hidden um things you know the things that really stuck out for me was when my teacher sat me down and said you're you're really good at this um because at that point i just felt like i was surrounded by so much negativity in the classroom um, or in, in workshops, especially, um, that I, I just felt like I was failing. I mean, you know, and then matched with all the rejections that you get from the, the lit mags and, and even my school's lit mag, like, I don't know how many times I tried to get into both of those ones. And, and it was just like, by the time I graduated, I was just running on pure stubbornness. Um, it, it wasn't an assumption that I had any talent. Uh, I didn't really think that I was all that great of a writer until Obama said he liked my book. <laughs> so, I mean, that was like, that was when I was finally like, okay, that is purely organic. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. Like, all right, I, I must be kind of good at this if he says so. So, um, so I, you know, I, I think in that sense, like the, the traditional workshop, um, is, is not all that great, mm -hmm. uh, for, especially marginalized students and, and um, adverse students and non-traditional students, uh, because we do bring um, stuff that is not in the writer's academia language. Right. And that's kind of part of, you know, what is so incredible, I think, about all your writing, you know, and I think there's a point in class where you talk about, you know, how most people were bringing in essays about like what they did on their summer vacation or like what they did during their year abroad. I think, you know, those were like the two, um, you know, themes that were circulating, you know, and you were writing about cleaning toilets. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about what you had said before about like the constant rejections, right? Like this idea of like um, being told no and 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 how it feels like this um, other love of yours, the, the rock climbing, you know, feels like this just gorgeous metaphor in terms of, you know, like this idea of a kind of ascension that is also about healing. I think you write about how like 
all of a sudden, like the pain in your back seemed to at least be um, lessening. Um, and I, I wondered about, you know, your, um, how you think about, do you think about like the act of writing as, as an act of healing? Um, do you feel like those two things are? Um, no, I mean, processing, yes, but healing, no. Um, I, it's, it's not for me at this juncture, at least, because, um, I know that as soon as it's published, I'm going to have to talk about it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so that aspect of it is, is, is really anxiety inducing. Um, I, it took me two and a half years to finally get started on this book because, mm-hmm. and that was, I was on contract and asking for, um, or I was under contract and asking for extensions over and over again, and, and just could not produce anything um, because every word that I wrote got me closer to book tour and and having to promote it and talk about it and defend my opinions and and my choices and um going through that with made was was really traumatic um just to kind of be sent out into the world all by myself and and have audiences uh ask me like why I didn't abort my child and and um and so I I haven't really experienced that much healing. It's more of, of just being able to process things. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you're ever fully able to heal from, from really traumatic things. I think you just kind of learn to recognize when it's creeping up and affecting you. That's so interesting about book tour um because there's you know the very private wonderful world of the writing you know like the quiet writing space and then there's that um and then suddenly like you're on a stage and I would imagine you know you write about kind of the the relationship between poverty and privacy right like that you're expected to sort of explain yourself in certain ways right like you're expected to sh- to to account for certain things um you know because of housing insecurity or food insecurity that's some you know that you need to there was a, a moment you know where where you you write about like the deserving poor um and the idea that you might get caught in some kind of frivil- frivility like having a cup of coffee with a friend and so I would imagine just like the public the the sort of the relationship to the public right um and and the desire to really like hold on to the private and keep it safe like keep the book safe like in the way you know um I I imagine like the book tour should it would be you know um just it could be as wonderful as it I would imagine could be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I put a lot of effort into um, finding ways to enjoy this book tour. Like I flew a friend of mine up to New York for the launch, and and had several friends of mine from the area there, and we went all all went out to dinner and had like cupcakes with like my book cover on them, and and. Mm. Um, I made myself some merch, uh, (laughs) and, and, you know, gave it away to people. And, um, I really tried, um, because I mean, when it comes down to it, like I, I am writing, like you said about very, what most would consider to be private things. And, um, and I, I think, you know, being a public figure has been really hard for me. Um, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's pretty common for me to be out 
like with my daughters, like even like in another town, like in Seattle, um, and do a post about it, like after we're not there anymore, or, you know, I hardly ever post about something when I'm actually there. Um, and, and people will say like, oh yeah, I saw you, but I didn't want to approach you or anything. And it's just like, it feels really, um, weird to have this moment of like oh that that moment with my daughter wasn't private like you know I mean there's not a lot of privacy in in being a public being out in public um Mm -hmm. but there's still anonymity and and I I really I really miss that of uh and I'm sure to some extent my my older daughter does too um because people recognize her in town um and so I think, you know, this feeling of kind of being caught doing something uh, is still really prevalent in my life. And, um, and, and there are just like these little triggers that go off um, that are confusing to me because I'm in a much more privileged place, but I'm still getting triggered in kind of the same way. Uh, like I'll be up doing a keynote and barely making it through it because I'm so sick and I'm talking about like how I couldn't take a sick day. And so mm-hmm. like, it's very different scenarios, but it's still to me, essentially the same thing of just not being able to turn down work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, and, and, and I know that in the acknowledgements you you write about um, the sulky bitches writing club, um, you know, and that time where it was, I think, and then you had the the um, what was it, the no writing, the no writing club. Yeah, yeah. it it started yeah. out as the not writing club, right? Um, and it became, and then, yeah. yeah, and then someone called me a sulky bitch on Twitter, and so uh, I I took that and rebranded us. (laughs) I love it. Can you, so, so was there a point, um, I know you, you know, you wrote about it a little bit in the acknowledgements where there's this, that point in between the two books, um, where I imagine like there is this kind of pressure to keep going, to keep producing, to keep, um, and, um, could you tell us a little bit about the, um, Sulky Bitches Writing Club? Um, yeah. Um, I would, I would love to. Um, so my friend Erin Carr uh, and I, she she wrote the book Strung Out. Um, it was a really good memoir that came out at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, I, I called her up one day and like by that point I had tried like a book coach who had fired me <laughs> because she said she wasn't a therapist. And I was like, all right, that's fair. Um, and I tried everything possible to just sit down and, and work. Um, and, you know, at the time my husband's, um, uh, younger child was still living with us. So we had, you know, three, two teenagers and, and a seven-year-old in the house and, and dogs and and it was just everybody was home all the time as a pandemic and and I just I could not do it like at all I could not find space um I was also um experiencing uh repeated pregnancy losses and um and I still don't know like exactly how that affected me um and and so I called up my friend Aaron and I was just like I can't I can't do this. Like, I just need to be able to basically vent about all of the things that are keeping me from doing this. Mm -hmm. And, and so we started a, a, a zoom meeting and we met once a week, um, which is kind of amazing given, you know, by the end of the summer in 2021, I think we were all kind of tired of zoom at that point um and I I just uh it just became this place of no expectations um and a place where I could really be open about 
how, what I was struggling with, um, in other spaces, when I tried to talk about things that I was struggling with, with being a public figure, um, I, I was kind of just told to sit down and shut up, uh, because they all wanted what I, what I had, uh, and I should be so grateful and lucky and, you know, do nothing but enjoy it. And, Mm -hmm. um, so it was like, I wasn't allowed to struggle, um, with being kind of like this breakout kind of unexpected success. And so, um, I, you know, and then the, the zoom meetings turned into a very chaotic WhatsApp. Uh, I think we, at one time we had like 10 threads that were just like, one was just purely for skincare. <laughs> like, <laughs> And like another was just purely about kids. And, and, um, it was, I think at one point we had almost 20 people. Um, and that was a bit much, um, I think now we're down to like five or six. And so it's just kind of been a, uh, a moment of like, okay, we got to shut this down. This is getting too nuts. And then kind of regrouping. Um, but I mean, it, the, the really beautiful part of it was, um, I mean, there are, I think at this point, like four of us who are in some stage of their book being published. So like, it's either, no, I think there's like seven, um, you know, they're, they're writing it or, uh, working through edits, um, or on, or about to be published in the spring. Um, and one's working on a screen writing thing and and um and when we got when we started the group it was we were all not able to write and so it was just kind of uh a bunch of women getting together and and carrying each other through uh an insurmountable task do you think that what do you, th- so, and do you think that that's what kind of like broke that Sia? Like, do you, do you, could you recall a moment in, in class where you, you, you were like, okay, it's happening. The book is happening. Do you, do you remember that moment? Yeah. I got an email from my editor in May, like mid May, mid to late May of uh, 2022. And she said, how do you feel about, uh, fall 23 publication date and I I was like yeah that that's awesome like that's kind of cream of the crop you know pub day um and she said great uh I'm gonna need the book by October 1st and I hadn't written anything like I didn't even have an outline (laughs) so um I it was just a a deadline that finally got me writing um And then almost every day uh, in the the thread that we had specifically for writing, at least one of us said, okay, who's writing today? And and a couple of us would say, yeah, I am. I'm going to be there in five minutes. And and it was just this um, feeling of not being alone in it anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. And, And I mean it's, it's an imaginary, you know, sense of accountability, but it's, it's still there. It's still something. Um, and it's like, no, I I've got to, I've got to do this with so-and-so because, you know, they're doing it too. And they're counting on me. So, um, Terror and, and yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was a lot of that. And it was a lot of me just completely freaking out about the content of the book and, and not knowing if I should include it or not. Um, not knowing if I should include, you know, the stuff surrounding the conception of my second daughter, um, or even that story line or thread at all. Um, and, uh, the names that I was using and, um, the events and, and, you know, writing about a college discriminating against me. And like, there's a lot of stuff that was pretty terrifying for this book. And, um, I don't, 
I don't know if I would have done it <laughs> without them. Without the pressure, you mean, or without, or? Oh, just without their oh, support. without your, right, yeah. right. Yes, yes, without without the, the sulky bitches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, could I ask you to read a couple a couple of pages with that? Oh, I don't have my book with. Oh, me. you don't. Actually, okay. I mean, do you... I guess I do. It's sitting behind me. Um, I could. Yeah. I don't mean to spring it. I I just there was there was one. Um, there were just two pages that I thought would be like so beautiful to hear you read out loud, but also I'm um, sure. I mean, and my stack of books behind me that are. I need to mail the people. <laughs> um, I was just thinking it, it it's in the testing hunger chapter. It's on 168. And I was thinking maybe you could just read from the losing money for food felt like punishment and then into to the to the end of the um page 169. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um Losing money for food felt like a punishment. My value, it seemed, was entirely based on whether or not I worked at a job that could be verified with a real pay stub. I didn't understand how I could be denied what they called a supplemental amount of food. Through TANF, the T-A-N-F, it's um, Temporary Assistant for Needy Families, um, certain types of classes would count toward work hours but they were ones that taught specific trades, such as car mechanics. My hours spent doing homework and physically being in class not only didn't count, they worked against me. How was I supposed to feel good about getting any kind of degree after I was denied money for food? I veered between two opposing thoughts. On one side, maybe Jamie had been right. Maybe getting an English degree while struggling to put food on the table was the height of selfishness. On the other side, I hated that whole argument and that I tortured myself by returning to it over and over again. How could I be selfish for getting a four-year degree at a state college? Of all the things in my life that I didn't have access to or felt like I didn't deserve for some reason, an education hadn't crossed my mind as a thing I wasn't supposed to have. Although the denial of food assistance and my pregnancy were arguably unrelated, the timing felt like another punishment. My awareness of the bad decisions I supposedly made was heightened by how much they went against the grain of what I should be doing as a food stamp recipient. The government, society as a whole, and even people who knew me had opinions on how I should act, speak, parent, and live. But becoming pregnant and choosing to have the baby was ultimately my right. I had the right to choose this, just like anyone else did. I had had the same right not to be pregnant and have a child six months earlier. I should have the right to be, I should have the right to an education and a degree that would help support my family. I should have the right to an adequate amount of food. It all felt like part of the poor people can't have nice things mandate. In this case, the thing I wasn't allowed to have was free will. How dare I make decisions for myself? This denial of access to food was a defining moment in my life. That letter symbolized a kind of death for me, an end to any hope I had of the system working in any way that would help me get out of this web. According to several reputable opinions, I had done everything right. I was in college, about to graduate with a four-year degree. That was supposed to be a major milestone on the imaginary path out of my situation of food and housing insecurity. Great things were to come from this magical slip of paper that marked my passage out of college. Once I had it, the opportunities were supposedly endless. But what society encouraged and what it actually supported were two different things, depending on what economic class you found yourself in. Nothing made my, me question my life choices more than knowing that my hours spent cleaning other people's toilets to put myself through college weren't enough, and that my hours spent earning a degree didn't matter by kicking me off food stamps. It seemed like they were telling me that higher education was something I simply could not afford. If I spoke up about this, I imagined people would tell me to be grateful for what little help I did receive. But the one step forward and two step back dance the government forced me to do felt purposeful, like the whole thing was meant to keep me poor. If I couldn't eat, if I was hungry, then I couldn't afford to aspire to anything better 
and I would have to keep working shit jobs that would qualify me for a small amount of money to buy food. Maybe that place in society, the real class I found myself in, amounted to that. Uh, so for context, the, uh, the letter that I received was I was kicked off of food stamps um, because I couldn't work 20 hours a week as a full-time college student. Yeah, I the, I mean, I, I found um, these two pages just like so um, profoundly powerful um, and this idea of class, um, you know, as this trap, right? Like as this, um, um, and then also this question of um, the act of educating oneself is, um, um, this selfish act, right? Like feeling as though the act, and then also the act of writing is a kind of selfish act. Um, and I was, um, I mean, you, you've already said all the things, all the beautiful things, but I was, there's a moment in the book where you talk about like, um, the idea of um, um, the male writer or, or the idea of being a kind of unattached, the, to be a real writer in certain ways is to be like unattached or unencumbered, right? Like to be free. And then th there's the the one who is not allowed to write, right? Which is like um, 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 the poor, the mother, the one that is like attached, right? That That is um, somehow um um under a kind of weight and you know i i mean i've felt more and more that the writing to me that feels like the most magical and strange and powerful and transformative is is the writing um you know that is written out of a particular kind of attachment or duress or or weight or um and, uh, but I, I was wondering if you could, if, if you wanted to say any more about, you know, this idea of, um, um, the trap of class or, or, you know, this idea of like the magical slip of paper, you know, is that, um, are we kind of being sold a, a particular bill of goods, you know, like is, is the paper actually magical and, um, and what, do you feel like is there, I mean, you talked a little bit about the MFA, but what you feel is the relationship between um, maybe being a writer um, and being like educated as a writer? I think the um, this whole thing about being like educated as a writer was always really confusing to me. Um, uh, I mean, David James Duncan um, once said, like at a book event, like everything you need to know is at the library. Mm -hmm. And um, and for me, it was like, well, yeah, that's true. But I mean, I can't apply for a job in academia and say, well, I spent 120 hours at the library and or, you know, like, um, I mean, even now, like I, I can't teach MFA students. And so um, there's a aspect of gatekeeping that goes on in that sense of like who, who gets in and why, and, but also who gets to teach who gets in. And, and I think, you know, there's, it very much to me felt like just, um, I don't know, not necessarily like the prop popular crowd at high school, but it, it kind of felt that way sometimes of just this like very elite um, writerly, you know, I don't know, kind of like uppity group of people that like I just didn't really mesh well with in the first place. And, um, and I kind of knew that I would get in there kind of by forcing my way in, you know, like, uh, I'm going to work three times as hard as all of you other people and, and, and get in that way. It was never a, you know, uh, presenting myself in a way that was like, well, here I am. 
and and like aren't you just so happy I'm here and um it was kind of this act of like begging and hoping and and wishing and um and and so it was I don't know it it was a weird feeling to um to know like the certain type of person they usually accepted and it it was um someone who who I think was not only like free and you know didn't have any ties but also would eventually have the capability of having someone to support them you know mm-hmm. by taking care of the domestic work and uh, allowing them to travel um uh, which is like something I have now, like my husband is, is the primary parent and stays at home, uh, or works in the home. Um, so I am able to do all of that. And, um, but at the time, you know, I was a, a single mom, uh, who was pregnant and, um, had no money. And, and so it, I was deemed an unsupported writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's almost a sense of like, not only, and if you're un, and somehow like um, unsupported, then you're also um, not real. Um, well, I think it's more just like, I'm not someone who will go on to write things that would reflect well on the program, you know, mm-hmm. and, and bring in more funding. Mm-hmm. Um they did bring me in to try and get more funding for the program. And, and uh, it was a really awkward conversation. <laughs> oh, so, you mean after, right. After the fact, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is it? Revenge is a dish best served cold. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Oh uh, um, yeah. I, I just, I left the conversation just so angry. Yeah. Like, well, I don't know that was yeah live and learn (laughs) yeah it's interesting because um I you know I was teaching um writing workshops out of my garage um for many years and then when the pandemic happened I started offering workshops on zoom and it was amazing you know how much interest there was and I think part of it is because like a lot of people like want to be given a little bit of that space to write, but don't want to, you know, but aren't between the ages of like 20 and 24 in a very particular situation with a support system. And, you know, many are caregivers, you know, um, older. um, and, And all of a sudden I had these writers from all over the world. And it was really exciting to just be able to sort of like all come together, like people that would have otherwise not been able to be in workshops. So it was, um, and then of course the stories that get written and um, the writing that happens is, it's exciting because it's, you know, um, it's sort of outside of that kind of bubble. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there's, there was this one line and it kept kind of pulsing for me, like throughout the entire book, um, as almost like, like a sob and it was, it's, it's this, it's, it's this little line and it just goes, um, my hunger was my fault. Um, and I kind of felt that you know that sob like through throughout all of class you know the the idea that um as much as like one knows one's hunger is not one's fault there is this sort of hunger the, the 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 idea that the hunger is one's fault is like stitched inside of you somehow and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that yeah um is that when I'm trying to decide if I should go to the food bank or not. I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. Nobody has like picked up on that. Um, I, I just, I, I had this thing about the food bank. Like um, I, I felt like it was for people who like had absolutely nothing like completely bare cupboards 
Um, and I, I could never bring myself to go. Um, not just because it's very visible, um, you know, as far as like people witnessing you going and, and, um, it still felt, I don't know, like I've lived in towns like, um, Port Townsend had, um, this thing called the free store. And it was just this church basement that was full of things that people had donated. And every Thursday from 10 to 12 or something, you would just show up and, and basically just go in there and take whatever you wanted, um, in a like organized mostly way. And, um, and it, it was just like, everybody went there and it was just very normal for people to go. It wasn't, uh, you know, there, there wasn't really a lot of separation. Um, and so for the food bank, it just, it felt like that would define me in a way that was different. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never really figured out why. Um, I think, you know, for me, it was, it was more of, um, well, I still have, and it was always peanut butter. Like I still have some peanut butter. I still have food. Um, I'm fine. Like I can, I can get through the end of the month or week or whatever. Um, and, and I thought that the food bank was reserved for people who like either didn't qualify for food stamps, um, because I know that there's, um, a very hard line, you know, between who qualifies and who doesn't. Um, and when you're just barely over the line, like you're not only barely making ends meet, but you also don't get government grants, um, of assistance for food or childcare and, and all of those things that I was able to get. Um, and, and so I, I felt like I had already been given enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and and, and that I did very much feel like it was uh, make my bed and now I have to lay in it, lie in it type of situation, you know, of the, um, well, like I chose to work less and go to school. So um, now I've just got to deal with the ramifications of that in right. some way. Like if you wish to go to to have this education, then, then it, then you deserve to be hungry, you know, that there's this kind yeah. of, yeah. And, and not in like the romanticized starving artist type of way. It no. wasn't, it was more of just like, um, no, this is what I chose to do. And right. so I can't ask for more charity. Right. So there's, right. So there, there's I, this idea that like on one hand, like, my hunger is my fault. And then also I'm not hungry enough. Like if I'm going to be like, so if I, I can go for me to go to the food bank means that I should be even hungrier, right? Like I should have like, like my cupboards should be even emptier than they, than they are like, so that they're not, em they're not empty enough. And I like going back to the conversation that you have with the judge about the child support, you know, when there's like this question of, um, what is it like? Why, why didn't you keep the job where you're getting paid $15 an hour? Um, that is, you know, where you're, um, I think it was from like two in the morning or, you know, until six in the morning so that, um, you know, like, why do you need to sleep? You should be making, you should be making more money. Um, why should you need to sleep? So there's this sense of like, to, um again like returning to this idea of like the deserving poor right like the like who who deserves support um and I just I I'm like so in awe of this book and like how um how generous you are you know with your story because I I can imagine you know just like putting the words down on paper. Um, and I, I do wonder, was there like a moment where you're like, I'm just gonna say it all. Like, I'm just gonna say the thing, like. Yeah, there kind of was. I mean, like the writing process was hard. Um, 
mostly because my daughter Coraline is nine and a half um, and she's still this very innocent you know she's definitely the baby of the family but like she's always just been this like very pure you know like uh like it's her first time in this world you know mm-hmm. like uh just um whereas like story and I have always been very broody and jaded from the from the very beginning and um and I really struggled with not just writing about my kids but like writing about things that I mean Coraline can't necessarily consent because she doesn't fully understand um the fact that I'm writing about her and all these people are going to read that I didn't know who the father was for the first year and a half of her life you know and um so that part of it was um was horrible, you know, to, to wrestle with. Um, and what it came down to is I have a Netflix series. Like I, I have, uh, a platform I'm, I'm, am more respected and therefore allowed to write about things and be angry about things that other writers, um, who are more marginalized, you know, are, would never, I mean, they would, it would be torn to pieces. Um, and so it, that part of it was the decision-making, uh, and, and also, um, that I, once I got to it, like once I started writing, I kind of realized how angry I was. Um, and I still had a lot of self, self self-doubt, like, because I was including a lot of stuff that I knew was going to piss a lot of people off. Um, like I purposefully put things in made that like would kind of give them things to focus on. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. like, and they did, and it it was kind of funny. Um, and so with this one, um, I, I turned the voice of self doubt, like into a character uh, Mm -hmm. and like, she kind of sat in the room with me. She was like my most hated horrible meanest goodreads reviewer um and i i named her she's i called her barbara from michigan and and just like she would talk like you know and and just like well i don't know why you're doing this and it's just like after a while it was just like well fuck you barbara like and and i'm gonna put all of this in there and because once you're out like as a single mom who doesn't have enough money for food and you're out like climbing fire escapes and, and tearing a hole in your leg and like having sex and, you know, all of this stuff, like you might as well put everything in there. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I would imagine like there is in, in that, in the memoir business, you know, you kind of just like you surrender, there is that surrender, but I also, I feel you in terms of kind of like, balancing like which part of the story belongs entirely to me and which part of the story is not is not mine um like I felt that with writing about you know I write a lot about um um motherhood um and and there as my boys get older there is this sense that um I'm almost like aware like you can feel like when there's this part of the story that is not yours to share at all um yeah 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 it's it's a it's a line you know I mean but it's not necessarily visible all the time and Mm -hmm. and so like yeah this is technically my story and this is um purely about me but I am also struggling through this thing because of you. <laughs> like, uh, mm-hmm. and, and so like situationally, you know, like kids having a temper tantrum or, you know, whatever. And you're just really struggling with being a mom. And, um, and it, it's really hard to only write from your perspective and your story uh, when it does involve this whole other human that you have 
grown and and fed and you know taken care of and and is now like I mean my oldest is uh 16 and a half you know and like every time I tell her like how many views there have been of this one TikTok where she is very much featured she, her response is always like oh Jesus <laughs> so, I does mean, she like, like it at all or um I don't think so I mean like it's just it's kind of normal but it's also I mean she did get to meet Hank Green recently and that was like a pretty big deal um but I mean all of her friends follow me on social media um and so I think she gets a little grumpy when one of them like like dude I saw this TikTok from like a year ago and like and story gets embarrassed and so um or just gets grumpy or you know like like or is just kind of reminded that all of that stuff is out there um I mean I have the same reaction (laughs) right I um I like how how you just you, you described yourself um your daughter uh, the two of you as like brooding and then and then Coraline as as you know the sunshine that that comes in um does does um does your daughter still want to be a writer I love the description where she, she's I guess she's six and she says she's she wants to be a writer and then you say like what is well what do you imagine a writer to be and she goes like <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with her face mm, right <laughs> um, <laughs> um no she she wants to be like a criminal investigator type like she's very into the csi type of uh so i don't know it changes a lot um but i think she is going for more science oriented mm-hmm. uh which great <laughs> like, yeah. I, I don't you know she's she's already doing so much more than I ever even wished for her. So, Mm. um, at this point, it's just like, don't burn yourself out kid. (laughs) So Mm. it's, it's more of, um, that kind of coaching than, you know, trying to get her to pick up after herself. Like that's Coraline. Coraline is, is, she's a mess <laughs> it's just like there's the two different personalities in in almost every way that's that's fascinating um do you, should we take some questions from oh hi omar <laughs> hi hi um yeah um looks like we have a couple we had a couple of comments um not sure if one was uh really relevant it was a a little bit maybe more to do with fiction (laughs) than nonfiction. um and uh we have a comment um uh which i'm sure we all agree with about uh designing uh systems to lift people up and out of poverty in a respectful meaningful supportive way um there must be ways we can design these human-made systems to function better and truly help our families making transitional funding as people move to higher pay rates. Um, uh, We do have a question from Jillian. Um, uh, Very good question. Um, Through all of the challenges and triumphs you have had, what does community feel like to you? What does success feel like to you in the context of living in this class uh, case system? Say it again, what does success feel like to me at this level of yeah Which? yeah where you where you are uh so what does community feel like to you and then what does free, uh success uh feel like to you uh at at the mo- at this moment where you are now um i think community is <clears throat> is a lot of like localized shared experiences you know it's um uh i'm just thinking of people in my town um and so there's that sense of community but then Um, I mean, all of my friends, um, are scattered all about the country and, and so our shared experience is being a memoirist and a mother at the same time. Um, so it can mean different things, but, um, you know, when I think about my, 
my local community it's it's kind of the people that you see in your neighborhood all the time um and and our town changed so much during the pandemic that like I don't see people I recognize when I go out and I don't see buildings I recognize um it's uh and there's traffic and it's just like uh it's it's really weird and so um I I don't know I I don't really have a sense of local community uh in the sense that I did during the time of the book um and a lot of the what went into the book was um trying to you know pay homage or or encapsulate you know that time and and just kind of hold it very dear and and allow people who live here or who did live here at that time to have the same experience um and success I don't know like I think I'm doing pretty well and then like I click on a link of the pottery barn and I'm looking at like (laughs) how much people are willing to pay for their kids pajamas and it's just like oh maybe I'm not at the level that I thought I was Uh, so I I don't know I mean I don't really know what is considered successful like I am uh I am who I am you know and and I still get the same runaround from my agent of talking Mm -hmm. about the uh the market and you know whether or not it's going to be able to sell and and so there's um as far as just being a writer like and and especially a public speaker um I I have reached a level of success that um not a lot of my I don't really know anyone who has which is really weird and isolating um and but it's also this it feels kind of fleeting um and so Mm -hmm. what I feel like my whole job is is to just stay interesting um and Mm -hmm. to keep people interested in in what I have to say um which is weird because I don't really like talking all that much (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) so it's it's been um yeah, it's 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 been a weird change of events with my career to go from writing to talking for a living. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone has a related question, um, which I personally think about because I'm I'm from a working class background and have had a little in- inch of social mobility in my life. Um, she asks, uh, "What are your thoughts on social mobility as it pertains to?" you know, having written two successful books, but also the known struggles of writers go through? I guess you you kind of answered that a little bit in the previous question. Um, Yeah, I mean, there's, um, I I think, you know, since I operate on a level of um, sincerity and authenticity, uh, that it's been really hard for me over the years to not feel like I'm a fraud, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so what I do to keep that going is, is I've kind of learned to really like go into myself and put myself in the moment, <clears throat> which is great, but it's also re-traumatizing myself and, uh, and my body has its limits. And so mm-hmm. it's, um, it's, it's really, it's, it's hard, you know, to, mm-hmm to have your whole brand be this really horrible time in my life <laughs> you know <laughs> that that like I'm I'm kind of used to talking about it now but like I especially at this point after like a month-long book tour it's kind of like oh, okay <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to some time off <laughs> yeah yeah I I sometimes I, I wonder like people have written books about cults and stuff like that, <laughs> like, like having to like talk about that on a book tour, <laughs> that, that must be like so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Well, um, someone does say, I want to tell Stephanie that she sounds as amazing and articulate on Zoom as she does on page. Uh, such a privilege to listen to her. 
Uh, thank uh, you. Yeah. And, um, this person also asks, uh, says, or uh, is asking, I'm also curious, having delved deep into work and class, what you think will be next for you as far as a book writing project? Um, there, I mean, I left this book on a cliffhanger, uh, <laughs> on purpose. I'll say that. Uh, yeah. and, but I mean, like I said, like I am hearing things like it's going to be a hard sell. I mean, the, the celebrity memoir, I think really changed, uh, the path of a memoirist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or just like, uh, how publishers suddenly view what is marketable anymore. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I did see uh, there's a comment, um, the signed personalized copies. Um, can I promote my own bookstore? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my, my own, uh, bookstore in, in Missoula there, they have a link, um, where you can get, I'm actually, my husband's out picking out, picking up boxes of books for me to sign. Um, uh, the, it's called fact and fiction books. Um, it should be on their website or Google search. I just tweeted out the link the other day. Um, and I think it goes out on my newsletter too, but you can order from them, uh, a book, both books, and I will personalize and sign them for you. And they will mail them, which is oh. nice. <laughs> I just put a link in the chat. Um, awesome. Um, let me see if we're missing anything else before we close everything up. Um, yeah, I'm there. I'm sure there's plenty for the next part. There's always something to say about motherhood. I don't know anything about it, but it seems like it's an ongoing pro project. So <laughs> I'm th I'm almost thirty seven, and my mom. You know, she's, she's still, she's there, still there. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. This was amazing. Um, I really appreciate your work. And like I said, as a, as a other, as another working class writer, it's, it's invaluable to have a community yeah. of folks. Um, and thank you so much, Sabrina, for being a moderator. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. So yeah. great talking to you and just like an absolute, just pleasure reading your work so thank you uh, thank you it's nice to um talk to a writer <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, it's just it ends up being a completely different conversation I always appreciate it I would so imagine, thank you yeah. yeah well thank you for the opportunity so and I'm just I'm I'm sending you all good light for everything that comes next thank you yeah. I appreciate that Thank you so much for to everyone in our audience for joining us. Um, please join us again in the future. Um, I dropped a link in the chat to um, future events that we'll be having. Um, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.